As Scott said, the genesis for this talk really kind of sprung up a, uh, a good year ago. <coughs> and Defiant Development is a 15-person uh, game studio we've been running for four years. We're based out of Brisbane, Australia. Uh, the core crew there is the core crew from Pandemic Australia, but since then we've, we've added on kind of a mixture of veterans and, uh, and new staff. Um, everybody there comes from a strict game development background, and that's really one of the things I'm, I'm going to talk about is kind of how we came to our various decisions, the sorts of games we make. We made a free-to-play game that did okay for us. Uh, it was called Heroes Call, and it was a Diablo-like um, that we released a couple of years ago. Uh, that got a lot of downloads, got a lot of traffic, uh, monetized okay, um, did okay, but not, not nearly as well as Ski Safari. And uh, it was from all the things that we learned through going through that process that kind of uh, made us look at what was involved in free-to-play and our decisions thereon. In any case, it was about a year ago that I had that conversation with Scott and we were talking about kind of how to, to best um, uh, express the, the various things that we went through at Defiant, how they apply to other people. Unfortunately, I couldn't get here last year to give the talk, which would have been a subtle and nuanced viewpoint outlining some of the potential pitfalls that await indie developers as they work in the broader social mobile space, with a focus on the commercial and practical implications of the free-to-play model, especially as it applies to companies competing for attention and marketing, which is, you know, kind of broadly the, the indie space. O over the year, uh, my thoughts have coalesced uh, and simplified, and we end up here. I am, by the way, uh, as pointed out, Australian, I've spent quite a lot of time working in North America, but, uh, but I'm blunt and, uh, and there will be some fucking language in this talk, as you may have gathered. So, I believe the audience here is mostly going to be pretty well educated on free-to-play and free-to-play game mechanics. Really, the target of this talk and, and the people I want to get this message out to in a broader sense are indie developers coming from a, a strict game development background. Uh, and I figure the audience here is going to be made up of some indie developers, um, some people in the, uh, in the vendor spaces who are kind of interested in the perspective of companies like Defiant because we represent clients, uh, and a bunch of people who saw the title and went, oh no, fuck that guy. I'm going to go and say some really terrible things on Twitter. So uh, the, the Twitter handle is there. Feel free to send all of the hideous abuse. But, you know, I also think that a lot of people might look at the title and say, ah, he's going to make that moral argument about, uh, about free to play. Oh, no. Oh, no. Fuck the morality. I don't, I don't give a shit about the morality side of things. Uh, the argument here really is a business argument. And it's not whether free-to-play is good or bad, but it's whether it's a good or bad decision for the, the sorts of businesses that, uh, that Defiant represents, which is to say reasonably successful small indie uh, social mobile studios. And we're definitely more mobile than we are social. I would never pretend we were, we were experts on the social side. Where we are, where our track record is, where our, um, where our grassroots experience is, is really gameplay, game mechanics. So, this comes out of a conversation that I have had so many times, so many times. I tried to tally them up, like I tried to run down the list of all the developers with whom I have had this conversation. And over the last two years, because we made a free-to-play game, uh, not early by any stretch of the imagination, but, but we got deeply into it at about the time that a lot of other indies were starting to, to get deeply into it in the circles that we travelled in. So, I ended up just repeatedly looking at people's games that they were about to release and going, hey, this game is fun, this game is cool, this game is awesome. Um, what's your plan? And they would say, we're going to make it free. I'm like, that's awesome. So, uh, so, what's your kind of core loop? Where are your pain points? Da, da, da. How's all this go together? What are you doing on user acquisition? How are you planning on launching? And they would look at me blankly. And I would say, cool, you're going broke. <laughs> and 
I've now seen this over and over and over again from indies. The, I've made my game, game's good. I don't know about free to play, but what I do know about free to play games is free to play, and play games make a shit tin of money. So I'm gonna make it free and I will make a shit tin of money. QED and we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out it's not so fucking easy. So, so my general response to, to that uh, lead out was to say, hey, I think maybe, you know, in a really tactful fashion that takes into account your expertise and that you're a professional, um, I think maybe you haven't thought about this super well and maybe you should just sell your game for money like people used to do in the old fashioned days, you know, horse and buggy, whip, sell a game for money. Maybe that'll work because you have no idea what you're doing in free to play. So don't do that. Um, and without fail, they would say, oh yeah, yeah, but you know, well, it'll work out. So the question then becomes, do you want to sit at the high stakes table? And they, like, ask anybody, do you want to sit at the high stakes table? People say, shit, yeah, I want to sit at the high stakes table. I don't want to be on the shitty little stakes table. I want to be on the high rollers table. But it all comes back to that, uh, to that fantastic saying that if you look around the table and you don't know who the sucker is, the sucker is you. But worse, like, if you're going to go sit at the high stakes table, you best bring some chips. These people don't have chips. They don't have pants. They are unprepared. They, they are in no way ready. If you're asking the question of, I'm wondering whether I should make my next game free to play, the answer is no. If you have to ask the question, you are unfucking prepared. If you do not have the people on staff to make a free to play game, you are not prepared. And you shouldn't. And if you do have them, you're not asking the question because you need something for those guys to do. Otherwise, they're just going to sit around and, you know, play high stakes poker all day or something. Um, you build games around your teams. And if your team doesn't have free to play built into its DNA, you're going to have a hard time. So. The, the ongoing conversation about do you want to sit at the high stakes table often turns into, well, truth be told, we hadn't thought about it like that. But, you know, we do look at the, the big titles out there. We do look at the top grossing charts. We don't have a lot more information to work off than that. We know those games make money and, you know, we thought we'd, we'd give that a crack. So if there's one message that, you know, I think at Defiant we would like to get across to other game developers as, as a, an option um, and a model that we've worked with, it's that there is a, another venue than the high stakes table. You can make a living making games that you like if you know how to make games. And I know a lot of people who know how to make games because that's kind of the background they come from and that's the people I talk to a lot. If you know how to make games, you can make a living making games. You don't have to sit at the high stakes table. You do not have to bet, you know, the keys to the house on every hand in order to get up. You can iterate forward, build games, get better at it, and work ahead. But I think, from my perspective, one of the biggest things that's missing when indies are kind of looking at the overall landscape and trying to work out where they stand and how all this goes together is the estimation of where does the market sit? You know, uh, for a long time when I was in console development, you could happily be anywhere in the top 10 charts for that month. And if you were in the top 10 charts, you were definitely making your investment back. And then things got more aggressive, budgets got more aggressive, and you really needed to be in the top two. And there, there be, suddenly started being this huge cliff between like the number one position that made like Call of Duty billion dollars and the number two position who maybe almost got their money back. And then you had games that were really good games. You know, they were top 10 games, talked about, sold a lot of copies, but not really enough copies because they were very expensive to make. So we have this whole sliding scale and console developers coming from that world, I think, have got very used to looking at the top two things on the chart as the only viable position. 
And that absolutely doesn't need to be the only viable position. If you know a few of the numbers on the top grossing chart, then you can pull up App Annie, you can look at other games that have shipped, you can work out how much they've grossed. You can draw the line under the curve very, very easily. And you can make an estimation of how much that game cost to make and you can work out whether they broke even or not. Of course, the important part there is you need the, the numbers. And uh, fortunately, Ski Safari has sold a bunch of units, so we have some numbers. Um, hopefully this is useful to, to indie developers. This is about what you gross at each of those positions. It's a sliding scale down from 70th, where you're doing about 15K per day, down to 1,000th, where you're doing about 1.5K per day. I, I will say these are rough and subject to fluctuate. Some of them came from a while ago. Some of them came from uh, holiday seasons. If you want to roll back through App Any and Ski Safari numbers, you can probably work out exactly which dates I pulled these from. Um, uh, it's higher on weekends. You know, there's a whole bunch of ebb and flow, but nonetheless, these, these will let you roughly work out what pretty much any title has grossed um, with the understanding that uh, from there it goes up to silly numbers and the top is always differing degrees of silly. Um, in addition to this, while you're trying to work out a budget for your game, and you have to work out a budget for your game because you have to work out how much it's going to cost you to make it, either in your salaries or in your sweat equity, and uh, whether you can reasonably make a return on that. <coughs> this is Apple chart stuff, and this again for Ski Safari is kind of what we make from other markets and other platforms. Um, Google Play is very good for us, Amazon's very good for us, Windows Phone is terrible for us because we're not on Windows Phone. Um, that's, that's no specific judgment on Microsoft, except it was a huge pain in the ass to get on Windows Phone, uh, and it wasn't worth the pain in the ass from the people we talked to who kind of gave us a sense of what numbers they were doing. Um, China does lots for Ski Safari. Uh, I wouldn't bank on doing lots, but uh, we've, we've been very lucky there. Um, Japan, no idea. We're looking into it. Hopefully it's okay. Korea, no idea. We're looking into it. Hopefully it's okay. So, uh, but the general rule of thumb is, you know, whatever you make, you can make about that again, spread across all the other markets. Um, which means if your game does okay, it's worth chasing all the secondary markets down. If your game only sells 2,000 copies, it's probably not worth your time and effort to go and chase other secondary markets. But as long as you do okay, you can certainly get more than your money back uh, in investment, in localization, and, and porting to other platforms. It's also a good thing to think about when you're thinking about you know, engines, tool set, and how you go about that. So, this is kind of all a polite way of me saying I, I'm delighted to add some data into the mix so that indies can go out and do their fucking research. Because God almighty, there's nothing worse than listening to somebody explain to you how their game's going to sell a ton of copies just like Game X that you know has you know, got great PR but sold nothing. You know, it's really easy to look at these sorts of things. It's easy to look at games that, that people point to and say, oh, that game was successful and it wasn't aggressive with its IAPs at all. And you say, yes, that's true, but I can also take a look at the Game Center charts and I can you know, say they had 20 million users and given their position, they didn't really turn those into money very well. Um, it's not hard and, and you really have to make sure that in the absence of people giving you data, because they generally won't, you need to go out and pull some of that data on the, the titles you're talking about. When you're talking about examples to, to draw from in terms of games that do in-app purchases well, make sure you're having a hard conversation that includes the numbers. Like, don't talk about the one that made you feel good on the inside. Go and, uh, go and dig it up. Um, go and make sure that you can justify what you're, uh, the argument you're making. So with all of this set, and at this point, you know, I'm hoping most indies are saying, Yes, of course. Morgan is wise. He uh, is clearly a man of wisdom. Have you seen that moustache? Yes. But what, what will we think of? But no, maybe, they, uh, maybe you're still saying yes, no, I think we have what it takes. Let's, let's do free to play. We haven't done it before, but everybody has to start somewhere, right? That's, that's great. You know, the way we did it, and this is the way we do everything, is we gathered as much data as possible, then we proceeded to ignore it and learn why we're idiots. Um, there are so many ways to do it wrong. You will discover 
new and magical ways to fuck it up. This represents all of the different talks here that you need to absorb to have an introductory baseline understanding of the things you might fuck up. There's quite a lot of them. And you can't be in all the tracks at the same time. It's very hard. Um, so there are a lot of places to screw up. One of the ways we screwed up, uh, and one of the things that made the biggest and most dramatic difference is we ended up blowing our budget on polish, which meant we then had to turn to a work for hire project or almost immediately after release. So we didn't have the full team available. We couldn't uh, aggressively support the game out of the gate. Um, and that was insane. We should have released the game, you know, buggy and terrible uh, two months earlier and spent those two months on polish. But our kind of console developer, you know, get it all fixed before it goes in the box, patches are expensive mentality is, is what was holding us back there. But we also, you know, we made mistakes about how easy it was to change data, you know, whether you needed a full download, the things we could fix on the back end. We thought we could tweak all our numbers on the back end, and then we found out that we could, but then we couldn't make that live. Um, so we needed to update a, uh, release an update that would fix that. You know, there, there, there were a litany of ways in which we failed. We also made our initial monetization very aggressive and it made people sad. And we listened to people who were sad and then we made it much less aggressive and, uh, and they were happy, but our monetization was terrible. Our monetization was terrible when we made them sad too, by the way. Like, don't make people sad. That's just a bad idea. So we got less complaints, but, uh, but we weren't really making much in the way of uh, revenue from it. So, and we were selling content and, oh God, a whole bunch of things that are unwise, unwise. And I think this is, you know, this is one of the things that I, I most want to touch on here, which is I'm a game developer. And as a game developer, I regularly deal with people who understand absolutely frickin' nothing about game development. <laughs> but who think they do and are really patronising at me as if there's no skill involved in what I do. And I've been doing it for 15 years, you know. I, I'm not saying that I'm hugely skillful, but I, I, I've done what I described earlier. I, you know, I've taken a lot of information in and then I've proceeded to make huge fuck-ups and learn from them. So I've got 15 years of education on things not to do, which, uh, which counts for something. And it's really condescending <laughs> when People are like, oh, games, yeah, I know how to make games. Why don't you, you know, take that Call of Duty thing, but, you know, put, put zombies in it. Zombies are big, that'll be a thing. You should do that. Ha ah, I could do your job. So, I find that terribly, terribly patronising. And it's exactly what game developers do when they think they can just run out into free-to-play and make a successful free-to-play game. It's completely disrespectful of the people who actually have expertise and skills in that space. And it's so common. It's so common. We think because we make games, we understand how free-to-play games work. Trust me, I, I have been very fortunate to work with a whole bunch of people way smarter than me. Like, a lot smarter than me. Um, but I still, you know, talk to them about free-to-play and they're, they're very intelligent game developers with really stupid perspectives. Because they don't have the expertise, they haven't spent the time in the trenches and it's really hard to get hard data, it's really hard to get the sense of sitting on the fire hose of data, changing things, tweaking them, watching what's happening with your users. So there are many, many, many ways to do it wrong. So we've covered quite a lot of options for this potential indie developer. They don't have the in-house support to aggressively do free to play. We've convinced them that maybe they can't just turn around and learn everything on Wikipedia this afternoon. So there's still another avenue here though because the person who will fix this, the person who will do it for you, is the publisher. If I can get a publisher, they will tell me they know free to play, they have the secret source, and they can turn my turd basket into a miraculous flower. <laughs> and the truth is, generally they can't, and it's probably not in their interest to anyway, because they've got like a whole bunch of games they're working on. The ones that are complete turds aren't worth the effort. Like, it's really hard to dramatically move your attention. It's really hard to dramatically move your monetization without really, really substantial overhauls. It is nice to have somebody with experience looking at your builds and giving you feedback on the things you're building. But again, you know, 
if I was making a game with combat in it, and I said, we're not going to have any combat designers or combat animators, but we are going to have a couple of combat designers and animators at the publisher, and they're going to chime in once a month and kind of let us know how it's all going. You won't make a good game. You just won't. You need the skills on the ground where it matters. And likewise, you need, if, if you're going to make a free-to-play game, you need experts at the table where they can be heard. Um, also, as I say, publishers see a lot of games and the model tends to be support the ones that do well. So you need to do the work of getting it to, to do well and be exciting and they can then handle user acquisition for you and move, move users at you. Some of them can be more involved in the development process and offer and bring expertise to the table. But it's not a magic bullet. It, it will not compensate for your blatant ignorance. So, um, so that's a thing that, uh, that works less well. So what I'm going to suggest here too is that for developers who want to make games, it's nice to be able to make games and my big principle is that you get good at making games by making games, releasing them, learning from them, making more games. Now you can do this by running a game as a service, you can learn and iterate and go through, but I actually think particularly for, for smaller indies, you're better off to be able to keep moving new games out that build on the learnings you've had previously. So I'm going to suggest that there is an alternative to the games as service model that works better for indies, which is the game is a thing that you put in a box and sell to people and then move on to doing something fucking new. Because games as a service is really time consuming. Like even support on a premium game with no APs is really time consuming. If you're doing mobile volume, it's really time consuming. It's a lot of people. Just community management and looking after your audience is hard work. If you're doing a full-blown game as service, then to be fair, hopefully it's paying for the live team, so you know that's, that's covered. But as a smaller indie, you've got split expertise. You end up with, with difficulty uh, moving on to your next thing, and, uh, and it becomes a lot harder. If you can make a game and ship it, and then it can continue to bring in revenues while you work on your new game, that is an infinitely better situation for most indie devs. So, what about IAPs? What about going free one day? How militant am I here? Put IAPs in, go free one day. Put chart boost in, put some sort of ad serving in. Make sure that you can switch this on at a later date when you do go free. Make sure that you can differentiate your free users from your paid users. All of this is good because you're gonna to wanna to throw that game free when it falls off the charts and collect whatever cents you can at that point in time. It doesn't matter if you don't monetize well. You're not doing user acquisition. We're not talking about a, a, an aggressive free-to-play campaign. We're talking about, I've just dropped the price point to the, to the minimum bar. And you really want to sweep through and you know, get different customers at different prices. Fundamentally, what I'm saying is if you don't sit at the high stakes table, you can continue working on games, they can continue bringing in revenue, you can continue making more games, you can keep getting better at what you're doing, and that is the recipe that leads to overnight success. And I've seen this many, many times. So that's what I'm talking about, is making games that make you money so that you can make more games, so you can make more money, and you probably won't be a 10x return but at least you're not all or nothing on the high stakes table with no fucking chips. So, let's make some fucking games and then make some more games and then make some more games. Thank you very much.